21st. It is 1 o'clock. Members, we have nine bills today. We're going to go ahead and uh, try to move these, thrill these bills through this afternoon. If we aren't successful in doing that, we will come back this evening. We'll come back at about 6 o'clock, and we'll meet in this room, and we'll finish up whatever bills we had left. Hopefully, we can get through the bills today. Uh, we're going to have a limit of two minutes per testifier, and the committee administrator, Owen, will uh, let you know how you're doing time-wise. We've done the two minutes. We will ask you to wrap it up. Today, the first bill we have is Senate File 3885, Senator Coleman. Senator Coleman, would you please come to the table? Senator Coleman, welcome to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Yes. Senator Housley, would you move that Senate File 3885? be considered, passed, and moved to the general orders. So moved, Mr. Chair. Senator Coleman, whenever you're ready, if you'd like to go ahead and address your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do have an amendment. Senator Coleman has the A1, A2 amendment. Senator Housley, would you pass the A2 amendment, please? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pass the A2 amendment. Senator Housley moves the A2 amendment. Senator Coleman to the A2 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We are working on polishing the tax portion of this bill, and so would like to remove that portion from this bill for now and then have it go through the tax committee later. Thank you, Senator Coleman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The A2 amendment is adopted. Senator Coleman to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill is an attempt to expand access to paid family leave for Minnesota employers and employees. We know many employers in Minnesota already offer paid family and medical leave, but for many Minnesotans, their employer hasn't been able to offer this competitive benefit due to costs. For businesses which are too small to self-finance an employee benefit program, the options are limited. Many businesses, which do offer some form of paid family and medical leave, use short-term disability insurance to cover mothers who give birth. It is an imperfect fit and doesn't fully serve the need of families seeking paid leave options. This bill would authorize the creation of an insurance product specifically tailored to paid family and medical leave. Businesses would be able to customize it based on their employees, and it will help them afford providing for paid family and medical leave through insurance. It is the simplest and quickest way to expand access to paid family and medical leave. Because this program is in the private sector and builds on the expertise of businesses, it can be launched quickly and ensure more people have access to leave sooner than any other path for paid family and medical leave. It will also help small businesses compete for top talent. Many small businesses struggle to compete with big corporations for benefits and can't finance benefit offerings without some sort of insurance support. And I have a number of testifiers, Mr. Chair, so I'll keep my comments short. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Uh, again, testifiers, remember, we're going to keep you to two minutes. So to start with, uh, Mr. John Reynolds. Welcome to the Commerce Committee, uh, Mr. Reynolds. If you would introduce yourself, state your name, and who you represent, proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Dames and members. I'm John Reynolds, State Director for NFIB in Minnesota. We're the state's largest small business organization, representing over 10,000 employers in every corner of the state, and 75% of our uh, members have fewer than 10 employees. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Senator Coleman for authoring Senate File 3885. NFIB appreciates the thought that went into it uh, and her interest in hearing from small businesses as she drafted it. Uh, NFIB is happy to support this bill. Senate File 3885 will allow new insurance options for small employers seeking to provide paid leave to their employees. Importantly, it does this without increasing taxes, disrupting existing benefit sets, or imposing inflexible mandates on Main Street businesses. 
<clears throat> Even in the face of a pandemic, employees expressed high rates of satisfaction with existing benefits. A 2020 report by the Employee Benefit Research Institute found that 77% of uh, employees were offered paid vacation, 66% were offered paid sick time, and 61% of employees viewed their paid time off and leave benefits as excellent or very good. Uh, given that many small businesses currently offer paid leave, it's important for legislative efforts not to disrupt existing, existing employment arrangements that work for employer and employee or impose an unfair burden on small businesses that makes it harder for them to compete. Authorizing paid leave insurance policies to be sold in Minnesota allows small employers to preserve or supplement existing benefits while providing those who would like to offer paid leave a customizable option for doing so. Simple laws like this can make a real difference. In some ways, uh, Senate File 3885 is reminiscent of the Agriculture Cooperative Health Plan uh, that this committee approved and became law in 2017. Uh, ag cooperative health plans were a response to deteriorating health insurance markets in greater Minnesota and were a novel concept at the time. Uh, despite it being a four-page bill, much like this one, uh, and some skepticism at the legislature, the law was an immediate success. It resulted in new affordable choices and more control for tens of thousands of families across greater Minnesota. We believe Senate File 3885 has the same potential, and we hope that the committee will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Robin Rowland, can you please come up? And uh, Corey Anderson, if you'd like to also come up. Robin, if you'd state your name, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Robin Rowan with the Minnesota Insurance and Financial Services Council. Uh, first, I would also like to say thanks, Senator Coleman, for bringing uh, this very important bill to us today. Um, life insurance companies have been successfully delivering paid benefits, uh, disability income, and administering self-insured paid family leave programs for decades. Life insurers currently administer benefits for over 62 million workers, process over 2 million claims, and pay over 11 billion in leave benefits annually. Senate File 3885 leverages that experience, expertise, and infrastructure so the state doesn't need to build an insurance company from the ground up or tax employers and employees to pre-fund a program. Employers will also benefit from this experience as well as the flexibility embedded in Senator Coleman's bill. They will be able to work with knowledgeable insurance agents to build a leave program that works for their workforce and for their budget. Insurers are also able to provide employers and employees with additional services, such as tracking absences, compliance services, increased benefits for employees who may be able to return to work early, and programs to address any special needs employees may face in returning to work. Like disability insurance, paid leave insurance would be regulated by the Department of Commerce. Based on the industry's success in providing paid leave insurance through New York's program, insurance companies are ready and excited to bring this product to Minnesota. Most recently, Virginia enacted a bill similar to SF 3885 with overwhelming bipartisan support. With the passage of Senate File 885, employers, especially those who are unable to self-insure, will finally have access to an affordable way to manage the risk of providing both medical and family leave benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Uh, next, if Ms. Chopworth, if you would please come on up. Uh, Mr. Anderson, if you would go ahead and state your name, who you represent for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Senator Dames and Mr. Chair and Committee, my name is Corey Anderson. My business is Disability Geek. We do disability insurance plans individually and on a group basis, short term and long term, all over the country. I'm also representing the Health Underwriters Association of Insurance Agents. I'm on the board. I'm also on the board for the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, Minnesota chapter. So representing all them on this bill. This is something we've needed in the marketplace for quite some time. And it's something where it would take away some of that burden between maybe an employer and an individual on does this qualify that your mother has this health issue or your spouse has this health issue or your child has this health issue or whatever it may be. And what it does is it takes that burden out of the employer-employee relationship and brings in a third party that can make that decision on what's approved and what isn't approved. And so we think this is a wonderful uh, bill and a product that is needed in the marketplace. It's already in a couple of other states already with some success. And we'd love to see this bill come through. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And uh, Ms. Schothorst, if you would uh, 
Be seated and uh, Vicki Stoot, uh, if you would please also come forward. Uh, Ms. Schothorst, if you would state your name and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lauren Schothorst and I'm the Director of Workplace Management and Workforce Development Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, a statewide organization which represents more than 6,300 businesses of all types and sizes and a half a million employees. The majority of our members are small and mid-sized businesses. With me here today is Vicki Studi, the Chamber's Vice President of Programs and Business Services, and she is responsible for the strategic development of new opportunities to help our members grow their business, support their workforce, and remain competitive in this tight labor market and global economy. As the Executive Director of MCBS, which implements group insurance products and provides professional association management services, she has a direct line of sight into what businesses are concerned about, interested in, and need to support their goals. We are testifying in support of Senate File 3885. To start, our members share the goal of giving Minnesotans access to the time needed to care for themselves and loved ones. The question then is how we achieve that goal. Our members over time have developed practices and benefits specifically tailored to account for economic and workforce issues in a way that works for their operations and importantly, takes care of their employees. We want to reiterate to the committee that our members consider their workforce one of the most essential and valuable parts of operating their business. If the state mandates expansive new benefits without regard for their cost or relevance to the employer and its workforce, its industry or market, costs will go up and other benefits will go down. The results are reduced staff and job opportunities, hours, benefits, which hurts workers and their families. Balancing employer and employee needs, program scope, and costs are really com important components of the conversation we're having today. It is especially important to em emphasize that due to the pandemic crisis and its economic impacts, particularly the $2.73 billion pandemic unemployment tax increase just assessed on Minnesota's business community, a voluntary approach based on individual economic circumstances is the best approach. It is true that for some employers, offering a paid leave benefit has not been an affordable or accessible option. By supporting the approach in Senate File 3885, the legislature gives an emerging market the go-ahead, and employers as well as trade associations will have access to another way to provide paid leave to their members and employees in an affordable manner with a policy that has been developed in the market, ultimately to how the employer wants to tailor the policy to fit their workforce and will have the benefit of scale without imposing an unworkable one-size-fits-all mandate on all employers in the state. And the small business tax credits that we'll be talking about in another committee will help address the affordability question head on. For these reasons, we specifically encourage a yes vote on Senate file 3885 and a no vote on attempts to impose a new pay leave mandate on employers in Minnesota. With that, I'd like to pass it over to Vicki to share a few comments about our organization's interest in this product and how we would be positioned to bring this opportunity before thousands of Minnesota's business decision makers and our local chamber partners. Well, thank, thank you, you. ma'am. And Ms. Studi, if you'd go ahead and state your name and who you represent, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Vicki Studi, and I appreciate the opportunity to share more information with you in support of Senate File 3885. As the Executive Director, I have the good fortune of working alongside businesses across Minnesota and providing them with an array of products and services to help them grow and invest in Minnesota. The discussions we have with them and the data that emerges tells us firsthand that businesses are increasingly concerned with their ability to manage risk in the workplace. Increasing healthcare costs, supply chain disruptions, and the rising costs due to inflation, talent acquisition and retention, as well as a lack of competitive health benefits are just some of the risks businesses face today. Given these challenges, a variety of solutions is vital and a one size fits all approach does not work. The diversity of our businesses, size, industry and type, as well as location demands it. Minnesota Chamber Business Services have, has been providing education resources and products and services to businesses for more than 50 years. Businesses trust in us to ensure they have the access to the latest information and solutions to meet their business challenges. MCBS partners with experts that have the knowledge in a variety of risk areas, including employee leave and disability, property casualty coverage, life and disability, voluntary products, and specialty lines such as cyber risk insurance, 
and pooled retirement ben plan benefits comprise the portfolio. As the regulatory environment and the industry market conditions fluctuate, changes in market services and products must occur to ensure competitiveness. A family leave insurance program can take on the burden of understanding leave compliance and managing employee recovery so that companies can focus on their core mission. Leave compliance, benefits administration, cost mitigation, and absence management would all be handled under such a program. It also allows for administration and coordination of the paid family leave on top of other federal and state leaves and updates and implements necessary changes to no laws that come into effect. I can speak that our members would be very interested in learning more about this solution. Thank you. Well, thank you, ma'am. Next, we have Deborah Fitzpatrick, and I believe Deborah is going to join us by Zoom. Deborah, are you with us? I am here. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, if you could state your name and who you represent, and you have two minutes for your testimony. So please go ahead. Hey, Deborah. Thank, thank you. My name is Deborah Fitzpatrick, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research at Children's Defense Fund Minnesota. Thank you, Chair Dames and Senator Coleman for recognizing the critical importance of supporting businesses, workers, and children when the inevitable need for family leave arises. However, we are concerned that the approach taken in Senate File 3885 will uh, do little to expand access and likely exacerbate current opportunity gaps. Several aspects of the bill will likely result in further divisions between workers with and without paid uh, family leave support during critical times in life. Some of these relate to the tax credit, which I'll take offline with Senator Coleman since you're working on those pieces. But I'll, I'll concentrate on the insurance, uh, private insurance piece today. Nothing in the bill prohibits employers or insurers from excluding workers from coverage for a variety of reasons. Um, these, uh, the private disability uh, marketplace shows us how some of this works. For example, uh, it doesn't protect against pre-existing conditions being excluded. Pregnancy, for example, is a common one. Or being in a high risk group, women and older workers, for example, can um, receive disparate treatment in these programs. Or uh, those in a lower wage job class. So because the bill does not leverage a broad statewide risk pool and relies on private insurance products with underwriting practices and profit margins, the employers and workers will in effect be paying significantly more per worker covered and likely be doing so for a less generous benefit. We only have to look to the health insurance market to see how many of these concerns have shown up in practice. For all of these reasons, states across the country and countries around the world have turned to the social insurance model included in Senate File 1205. At CDF, our mission is to ensure every child has a good start in life and successful passage into adulthood. We are concerned that the approach included in Senate File 3885, while well intended, leaves the majority of babies, children, and families behind and urge you to consider the proven solution outlined in Senate File 1205. Thank you for your time today and your commitment to children and families. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fitzpatrick. And next we have Erin May Quaid. Are you with us, Erin? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if you would go ahead and state your name and who you represent, and you have two minutes for testimony. So welcome to the committee, Erin, and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Erin May Quaid. I'm the Advocacy Director at Gender Justice, a legal and policy advocacy nonprofit advancing gender equity through the law. And I'm here today to ask you to vote no on Senate File 3885. If there's one thing the pandemic has made clear, it's that every Minnesotan, regardless of income or industry, needs an equitable system that allows them to care for themselves and their loved ones when they're sick without sacrificing their income. Unfortunately, Senate File 3885 does nothing to create this system, in particular because this bill does not address paid time off for Minnesotans to care for themselves. Instead, this bill creates a profit stream for insurance companies and an inequitable and inaccessible system for Minnesotans. Here's how. Unlike a statewide plan that provides every Minnesotan with the same length of leave, standardized income replacement levels, and the same job protections, Senate File 3885 grants incredibly broad discretion to insurance companies to figure out what paid family leave looks like. Under this bill, private insurance companies could determine who can take leave, when they can take leave, how long they can take it for, what they can take it for, the differing cost to each person, and the amount of income they replace. 
There's no need for this bill to leave it open for insurance companies to decide what paid family leave looks like because there has been a ton of evidence and research and examples from other states and countries on what families actually need. Unfortunately, this bill does not take any of those evidence-based approaches into account. Private disability insurance plans like this have been on the market for years. They remain inaccessible to a majority of workers, especially employees in low-wage industries who already at lack access to paid leave. Worse, insurance companies are known for discrimination, charging women, people with disabilities, people of color, senior citizens, and people with chronic illnesses higher rates for less coverage. And with absolutely zero protections written into this bill, insurance companies would be free to exclude paid leave coverage for Minnesotans who are women, or pregnant, or married, or divorced, or single, or have a dog, or live in a boo house, or are tall. Literally, this bill does not stipulate one thing that insurance companies are not allowed to limit, reduce, or exclude coverage for. For senators wondering how racial and gender disparities are created and maintained in our state, this is a perfect example of how. Uh, truly, it's not unfathomable that people who have more children would pay increasing and higher premiums, penalizing those who want to grow their family or have more children. I want to end by saying that the for-profit insurance industry is not going to solve the crisis of caregiving ongoing in our state. Private insurance plans have been on the market for years, and if they were the solution, they would have been part of the solution already. This bill really only offers another avenue of business for insurance companies while providing zero Minnesotans with paid family leave. At best, Senate File 3885 creates an expensive, unreliable patchwork system that would exacerbate already existing inequities and provide few Minnesotans with limited benefits for more of their money. Any bill that fails to provide paid family and medical leave to all Minnesotans fails Minnesota. I was the co-chair of the Attorney General's Task Force on Women's Economic Security, and we just released our policy recommendations yeah, that would strengthen the economic security of women in Minnesota. Um, and that would be Senate File 1205, a comprehensive universal bill for every single Minnesotan that includes medical leave, standardized wage replacement, job protections, and is portable from job to job. It's the proven model that works. It keeps costs low because it creates the broadest possible risk pool with no value loss to private profit seeking. Until we can pass Senate File 25 or 1205, I urge you to vote no on Senate File 3885. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And next we have Sarah Papenberg. And if uh, Mr. Dan Klott would please also come up to the testifying table. Ms. Papenberg, if you would state your name, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Papenberg, and I'm the owner a vinaigrette, a family-owned food store located in Southwest Minneapolis, and I'm a member of Main Street Alliance. Four years ago, one of our most valued long-term employees, Linda, fell and broke both of her arms. She was unable to work. If she went without her paycheck from us while she was out recovering, she was gonna have to choose between putting food on the table and making rent. But I've told this story many times right here, right before many of you. But we paid her while she was out because it was the right thing to do, and actually paying her saved me money and having to hire and train a new employee. But we were late on our commercial rent and our house payment. It was a real struggle. My story with Linda continues as Linda went on to be diagnosed with ALS and died May of last year. We looked into different private paid leave options when we opened Vinaigrette, and again, when I was challenged at a previous hearing on paid leave, I took that challenge and met with three different agents. However, their premiums were more costly than what the premium would be under a statewide paid family leave program. The programs also required a minimum hospital stay and, and excluded coverage for cancer unless as we employees, employers or employees could pay for a cancer waiver. The $3,000 tax credit outlined in Senate File 3885 is not enough to expand paid leave access to all small business owners and employees who currently do not have access to paid leave. In my experience, the private market options were unaffordable and substandard. Senate file 385, 3885 continues an employer lottery when it comes to paid leave access and is like, likely to exacerbate the current opportunity gaps when it comes to pay while on leave. Under, the, under this file, uh, employers are allowed to choose which workers to cover. Nothing in this file ensures employees currently excluded from paid leave, like lower wage workers, part-time workers would receive access. Nothing prohibits employers or insurers from excluding workers that are deemed high risk like women or older workers, for example. Nothing in this file protects workers or family members with pre-existing conditions. State fund, under this file, state funds can be used to provide higher paid professional workers even more generous benefits at a cost to the state and other workers that pay state taxes but don't receive the benefit. Many small employers like myself with less than 50 employees eligible for the tax credit can't afford to wait till tax filing season to be reimbursed for our expenses. 
A federal tax credit for family and medical leave has been in place since 2017. We have seen little increase in access to paid leave over the same time period. Unlike a social insurance program, there is no ongoing, ongoing funding mechanism. This shouldn't be a struggle for any of us. A private paid leave program would create further barriers to paid leave through cost and accessibility. I urge members of the committee to not advance Senate File 385 and support Senate File 1205 instead. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is uh, Mr. Dan Swenson clapped? Is he in person or are you planning on doing remote? Are you with us, Mr. Clark? Uh, seeing no response, uh, Reverend Samuelson. Uh, welcome to the Commerce Committee, Reverend Samuelson. And if you would state your name and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Miriam Samuelson Roberts, and I'm a pastor, a resident of Minneapolis, and a clergy leader with Isaiah. I see the way that strengthened families of all kinds are crucial to the fabric of our life together, our livelihoods, our businesses, and our communities. As I said, I'm a pastor, and I have given birth to two children in the last five years. I saw firsthand the complicated process of a small organization struggling to do right by their employees, one that did have the options similar to Senate File 3885 available to them, which leads me to believe that this bill is not the answer. When I was pregnant with my first child in 2018, I was doing the very challenging work of negotiating with my employer to get paid leave to take care of my newborn. The number of hours, deliberations, cost-benefit analyses, and tears that I and others shed over this painful process was not insignificant. Much of my employer's deliberations over this policy came down to people's own personal opinions, preferences, and experiences. It was all subjective when my need to recover from childbirth and care for my newborn was absolutely clear. It cast a shadow over my time at the organization and I'm no longer there. And I had the best possible scenario. A religious organization should have been the easiest employer to negotiate paid leave benefit with. My story affirms why Senate File 3885 is not the answer. Having workers, especially pregnant people or people who have to take care of a loved one at the mercy of their employer or private insurance companies puts them in complicated and vulnerable positions. One way to do right by each other is to offer adequate paid family time across the board without administrative hassle or deliberation. Please do not vote for SF3885. We need to live our Minnesotan values of care and community, and we need to do so with the interests of every Minnesotan in mind. Thank you. Well, thank you, Reverend Samuelson. And uh, next, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, members, any questions, comments? Uh, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to all the testifiers, and uh, Senator Coleman, thank you for um, really understanding and hearing that there is such a huge need, um, and uh, I appreciate this conversation. Um, we've heard a lot of reference to Senate File 1205, which is my bill, um, which would provide the, um, the more accessible and uh, available uh, plan that would cover not just family leave, but also medical leave, as has been discussed by testifiers. Uh, so um, this is an issue I care passionately about, as I know you do. Um, a question I have, and a lot of this was um, touched on in the testimony, but one thing I did want to ask you about, we've heard um, uh, in a bunch of you know, business and, and media reports about businesses who make certain benefits available, for example, at their corporate headquarters to the folks who work there, but those benefits are not then available to the people who may work in their other retail outlets or if it's a restaurant chain or something like that. Is there anything in this bill that provides assurances that everyone will be covered in a business? Mm -hmm. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Kent, for sharing um, this passion to address this issue. It's as someone who gave birth without any paid family leave. That's why it's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, this bill is specifically designed with broadness in mind so that it can be offered <coughs> uniquely to each unique employer based on their needs and what they can afford. And so while there's no assurance is guaranteed it goes to everybody, it's 
a tool meant for small businesses to be able to attract new talent. So including them in that is how they do that. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Follow Chair, up, sir, again. as just a follow up, um, uh, I appreciate that. And that therein is the devil in the details, right? Um, that when we're trying to be broad and allow maximum flexibility, which as a former business owner, I, I hear it, I get it. Um, but we also know, and uh, Senator Coleman, I know you will appreciate as much as I do, this very painful statistic, mm -hmm. that about 25% to a third of women who give birth have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. That's a lot, a lot of parents and babies. And um, the concern that I have when, you, when we offer this as a premium, and I know we're not really talking about the finances here today, but my understanding is that there will be a cap on it because if there's not, that brings in a whole other list of issues. Um, we will be picking and choosing, and we will be saying that it's not available to so many employees. And typically, it is the smaller businesses. Um, as we heard, tax credits are more cumbersome the smaller the business is because of trying to front those costs and having to wait for the tax credit to come back in. Um, I, I just, I keep thinking about those 25 to 30, a third, 25 percent to a third of, of moms, um, and I just feel like this will help a few of them but not nearly enough. And um, I've carried this bill to 1205 for six years, haven't got a hearing on it in six years, um, but I'm glad we're having this conversation because it matters to too many people. Thank you. Senator Coleman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Kent, for that point. And I think that it's important to note that Senate file 1205, is that the House file, or com the Senate companion to 1200? It, does have a stipulation that there are exemptions if the employer has paid family leave insurance. So this is a part of an overall conversation and a piece of the puzzle, and there is no perfect answer. There's some proposals that will crush small businesses, others that don't cover everybody. And this bill is attempting to be a solution to a big problem. So thank you for your comments. Members, other questions? Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Coleman, thank you for bringing this. I think it's important that we have this conversation. Um, I am also on uh, 1205. I think it's, it's absolutely vital that we talk about the need for paid family medical leave. Um, and as we look, we can look across the country at some other states that have implemented programs and learn from what they've done. And, and one of the things that we learn is that about half of the people that take advantage of the statewide programs, mm -hmm. it is for medical leave, for their, to, to care for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes after uh, there are pregnancy complications, that's not covered under mm -hmm. pregnancy leave, uh, it's covered under medical leave. And so, um, one question I have about this is, is what was your thought process in, mm -hmm. in not including medical leave as part of this mm -hmm. um, and in leaving it just as family leave? Senator. Cool. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question, Senator Port. Um, there's no explicit intention to leave anything out. There are hundreds of things we could specifically list. The bill is written broadly enough to allow for them to craft it for each employer uniquely how that employer would like to offer the benefits. Senator Port, follow up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just, I'm looking at, at page two um, in section two as it talks about um, part three there, care of an employee's family member who has a serious health condition, but it does not uh, say an employee themselves. Mm -hmm. It is just for a family member. So I, I think there's some room there um, that we could, you know, make sure that, that this was broadened out um, or, or something that's missing from it. Um, and then, you know, just I'm thinking through what this, you know, when, when health benefits are offered to employees, oftentimes we pay a portion of them as employees. Do you have any numbers of what this might cost for both a small business and an employee? What are the ranges for these types of plans? Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Port, for the question. So as of right now, Minnesota is being 
revolutionary in that there are other states that have offered it, but never with the tax credit portion. And so we're going to find this information out and we are just starting this process. Like every other benefit offered to employees, the employer can decide how competitive they wanna make that benefit package based on what portion of the premiums they would like to cover. I've worked for some employers where they covered 75%, some less, some more. And so it's really going to be tailored to the needs of that individual business. And hopefully then we'll get some data because sometimes you gotta be the first. Members, Senator Ford, follow yes. up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, just across the country as we look at where these programs have been implemented, on average, uh, the average cost for for the program that we you know, are offering in, in 1205 is 0.06% mm -hmm. um, of income, and uh, the average for private insurance is 1.3%. Um, so just, just looking at, you know, there is a benefit to providing this to everybody, to spreading that pool across all employees rather than you know being able to pick and choose who has access to this benefit raises the cost of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Coleman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the consideration on that. And I hope that we'll get some data on how Minnesota is going to kind of pioneer this and get the costs so we can continue this conversation. Members, other questions? Senator Housen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Coleman, for bringing this uh, legislation forward. It is time that we have the, the conversation, and I know it's not the be-all, end-all, satisfy everybody, um, but I think this is a, a great option for both our small businesses and for our um, employees to have an option here in Minnesota. So I look forward to seeing where it goes uh, and how it's implemented and how it works and, and that data. So thank you so much, Senator Coleman. Thank you. Members, other comments or questions? Seeing none, Senator Coleman, would you like to uh, make your final comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say that contrary to some public comments made earlier today, no one is pretending to try to solve a problem. This is a genuine effort by a mother who had birth and did not have paid family leave to make an option for Minnesota families and small businesses. We know Minnesotans want to see more access to paid leave across the state, but they don't want to see a new big government program that takes many Minnesotans backwards. This proposal will expand the availability of paid leave across Minnesota, particularly for those who work for small businesses without creating a new government bureaucracy. Businesses will be able to provide a competitive benefit that suits their workforce and families will have more options to care for their loved ones in a time of need. Thank you to all of the testifiers who made an effort to show up in person and for the committee for their support and consideration. Well, thank you, Senator Colvin, and I too uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, a lot of good comments, a lot of good questions. I just wanna remind people that this bill has not been implemented yet. There's a long ways to go, and there's a lot of assumptions being made but let's let the actuarialists figure out the dollar cents and how this is all gonna work. So with that said, Senator Housley removes, <coughs> renews her motion that Senate file 3885 as amended be passed and placed on general orders. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. No. Motion carries. Members, next we will go to Senate file 3503. Senator Weber. Senator Weber, welcome to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, you have, uh, Senator Howe, would you move Senate File 3503? So moved. Senator Howe moves Senate File 3503 be, rec be heard and recommended to go to general orders. Senator Weber, I believe you have an amendment, the A3 amendment? There is an amendment. That is correct, Mr. Chair. Senator Howe, do you move the A3 amendment? So moved. The A3 amendment has been moved. Members, any questions on the A3 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A3 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The A3 amendment is passed. Senator Weber, to your bill, Senate File 3503 as amended. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, present this bill to you today. Uh, basically, the amendment reflects an agreement that the industry has reached with uh, the Department of Commerce as it relates to this bill. And uh, the main elements that are involved are mini minimum damage acquisition report, uh, a report that, quite frankly, uh, is allowed uh, by the Department of Transportation, for example, but which does not meet uh, the appraisal qualification standards under which licensed appraisers must perform. Um, then it also deals with out-of-state continuing education credit, uh, providing an opportunity for these uh, credits to be earned uh, and to be applicable in the state of Minnesota, and um, also dealing with other elements of education. And um, at this point, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would uh, turn the testifier table over uh, to Mr. Byron Miller, uh, who would uh, comment regarding the issue. And, uh, and I believe uh, Mr. Brickwitty with the agency is in the room as well. Well, thank you, Senator Weber. And to the testifiers, just to remind you, we're going to have a two-minute limit on the testifiers throughout the rest of the day as we have a lot of bills to do. So with that said, Mr. Miller, would you please introduce yourself, tell us who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator Dames and, and uh, committee members. My name is Byron Miller. I represent the Appraisal Institute. Uh, I am the chair of the Government Relations Committee. And I'd like to uh, talk briefly about the uh, four items on uh, this bill, uh, Senate File 3503. Uh, the first one has to do with minimum damage acquisition. Senator Weber uh, covered that very, uh, very well. Uh, it exempts appraisers from following the uniform standard of professional appraisal practices uh, when performing valuations for small value uh, real estate. Uh, the second item has to do with it's a, a minor administration, administrative change to customary and reasonable fees portion of a subset of the Dodd-Frank bill that we passed back in, I believe, 2016. Um, and uh, that impacts appraisers. It basically removes language requiring a fee survey as a benchmark for determining uh, the customary and reasonable fees. The third has to do with continuing education reciprocity. Uh, in a nutshell, this allows the uh, Department of Commerce to accept appraiser continuing education from a class or seminar that has been approved by another uh, state regulatory agency or in another jurisdiction um, uh, it, that has not been applied for in Minnesota. Uh, the fourth has to do with uh, language to clarify uh, a bill that was passed last year regarding all appraisers to take uh, racial valuation bias education. Uh, it sets a time frame on that. And with that, I would thank you all for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Brickwoody, if you would please uh, join at the table, state your name, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, for the record, Peter Brickwoody, Assistant Commissioner at the Commerce Department. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my thanks to the North Star Chapter of the appraisers who have worked with us on this bill. I think we have an accord on the language. Um, I think we have a good bill with some technical corrections and a specific uh, a new program for appraisers only um, that will help folks who are taking credit, excuse me, continuing, educa continuing education courses for credit that have been approved by other state regulators in other places um, that are unique to their uh, individual needs as a student and practitioner on an ongoing basis. And I'm glad that, to report that we were able to work out that language with the appraiser. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to stand for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brickwoody. Members, questions for Senator Weber under Senate File 3503. Thank you, sir. Thank Members, you. questions? Seeing none, Senator Howe renews his motion that Senate File 3503, as amended, be recommended to pass and move to the general orders. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion carries. Senator Weber, you're on your way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator Housley, we'll take your bill next. Senate file 2922. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, Senator Housley, welcome to the committee, which you're a member of. If you would uh, please move your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move <laughs> Senate entrance. File uh, 2922, please. Senator Housley moves Senate File 2922 be considered and moved to general orders. Senator Housley to Senate File 2922. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for the opportunity to hear, hear this bill. Senate File 2922 is legislation that will allow debt collection professionals to continue to work from home as they've been doing it for the last two years since the start of COVID. Uh, this bill clarifies a quirk in the existing third-party collection agency licensure structure that does not uh, reasonably provide for individual employees to work from home. Uh, the bill makes it clear that the license required for agency operations is not required for each employee's home while maintaining the same standards and regulations required by both state and federal laws. Um, this provision was uh, included in the 2021 Department of Commerce bill, and the department does remain supportive, but it was passed last year at the sunset of May 31st, 2021, so we need to pass this bill to make this allowance permanent so collections agencies have the flexibility to allow their employees to still work from home, just like all the other similar financial sector employees. Um, you'll see on the handout how important this has been uh, for collections uh, for these workers over the last two years. And with me, Mr. Chair and members, I have Michael Clutho with the Great Lakes Credit and Collections uh, Association to provide more information. Mr. Clutho, welcome to the, uh, the, the Commerce uh, Consumer Protection Committee. Please state your name and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Michael Clutho. I'm with the Minneapolis law firm of Basford Remley. I'm here today in my capacity as the immediate past president of the Great Lakes Credit and Collections Association. Our association represents debt collection professionals throughout Minnesota. Uh, we're here asking on behalf of the association members for your support of Senate File 2922. This bill would allow collection agency employees to have the option to continue working remotely something most of them have been doing for the past two years because of COVID, peacetime emergency waiver, and passage of a temporary uh, work from home legislation last session. Just a little bit of background. Due to a unique aspect of Minnesota's debt collection licensing statute, uh, collection agencies must secure a separate and expensive license for each location where an employee works. This requirement makes it financially prohibitive for collection agency employees to work from home going forward without the passage of this bill. The financial burden puts our uh, members, employees, on unequal footing with other financial service workers, in, in, including individuals doing similar work for first party collectors. Senate File 2922 would allow collection agencies to continue offering their employees a flexible option to either work in the employer's physical office, in the employee's home under secure conditions, or under a hybrid structure, uh, whatever uh, best fits the employees and an agency's need. Absent passage of this bill, our members' employees will lose this valuable work-life flexibility. Work from home has given them over the past two years. Uh, this language itself in, the, in this bill was included in the 2021 Department of Commerce Technical Bill, and the department continues to support its passage. All laws and regulations concerning collections, both state and federal, will apply regardless of where an employee is conducting their work. The Department of Commerce retains its authority to oversee all collection activity, Enforce all laws covering licensed agencies and registered collectors, including those working from home. It's worth noting that over the past two years, when work from home became the norm, collection professionals have demonstrated they are able to perform their duties remotely and in a safe and compliant manner. Workplace flex flexibility has become a critical component in the employee-employer relationship. Uh, we've provided you with a handout uh, that demonstrates how valuable this working from home has been to these collection employees. Without the remote work option afforded by Senate File 2922, collection agencies will become competitively disadvantaged when seeking new staff. Likewise, collection agency employees will be disadvantaged compared to their peers in similar industries. This bill will eliminate those disadvantages. The timing of this bill is critical. The current allowance permitting work from home expires on May 31st, so collection agencies are truly facing uncertainty or being forced to prepare for a worst case scenario. In short, unless Senate File 2992 is passed, all collection agency employees will be first forced to return to the office, regardless of whether it makes sense for their personal situations or their employees' needs. 
For these reasons, the Great, Clake, Great Lakes Credit and Collectors Association members uh, respectfully ask you to pass this bill to avoid what would otherwise result in an unfortunate, negative, and unnecessary impact on Minnesota employees. Well, thank you, Mr. Klutho. Members, uh, questions for Senator Housley or the testifier? Members, any questions? Seeing none, Senator Housley renews her motion that Senate File 2922 be recommended to pass and move to general orders. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank Senator you. Senator Housley, Thank you. Senate File 2922 is on the way to general orders. Senator Jasinski. Welcome to the Commerce and Consumer Protection and Finance Policy Committee, uh, Senator Jasinski. You have Senate File 3072. Senator Eichhorn moves Senate File 3072 be moved to pass and recommended to go to general orders. Senator Jasinski, do you have any amendments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, I do. I have an A5 amendment, which is a technical amendment, uh, something we uh, missed in uh, transportation uh, that was brought forward to us by the deputy registers uh, as a correction. Uh, so I would ask for someone to move the A5. If the A5 amendment uh, will be, if Senator Eichhorn moves the A5 amendment. Uh, members, any questions on the A5 or discussion on the A5 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A5 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The amendment carries. Senator Jasinski, to your bill, 3072 as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also have one oral amendment in the end, but I want to explain the bill first, if that's OK. Uh, this bill, uh, if you remember last year, uh, passed the Senate 67 to 0. Unfortunately, did not pass in the House of Representatives. Uh, so what was established was a working group uh, informed a salvage title task force which we worked uh, starting in the fall, uh, starting in September. We had seven meetings. Uh, that was uh, on, the, on the committee with myself with Senator Carlson, Representative Joachim, and Representative Petersburg. Uh, as I said, we had seven meetings, uh, worked out all the details uh, to make this bill where it is today, uh, a bipartisan bill, uh, full support by all the stakeholders, to my knowledge, uh, passing out of that uh, uh, task force. I think the last meeting was in January 26th of this year. Uh, it's a great transparency bill, uh, allows people, there, before this bill was uh, put into uh, work or into, uh, to start it, uh, there was a loophole uh, for vehicles that were less than $9,000 or, or greater than six years, uh, that if they had been severely damaged and, and uh, purchased by an insurance company, they were not stamped as a salvage title, task, as a salvage title vehicle. Uh, so what the working group did was come forward to reach an agreement uh, how that would be done. Uh, so now if there's a, a car that's below $9,000 or greater than six years, if it comes in, it is stamped as a prior salvage. Uh, the other vehicles were stamped uh, a different way, and then after they got inspected, they were, uh, they were transformed with a new stamp. But uh, this is the, the way it works the best with other states to make sure that it, it Minnesota is, uh, falls in line with what all the other states are doing. Uh, so it's a great bill, and I uh, look forward to passing. Uh, one thing that I would do I need is an oral amendment uh, that would actually take there's no fiscal note uh, So in the original bill there was a, uh, a blank appropriation and since there is no uh, Fiscal uh, note to this or no fiscal cost. We want to eliminate the uh, Language I think it's uh, section 13 line number 10.16 uh, as a blank appropriation, and to my understanding, I think maybe staff can report out better, but we need to eliminate that because there's no fiscal note. Chris? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members, yes. Um, we can just simply delete section 13, the appropriation section from the bill, so it would be page 10, delete section 13. Well, thank you, Mr. Stang, and uh, Senator Eichhorn will move the oral amendment on page 10, remove section 13, correct? Senator Eichhorn moves the oral amendment. Any discussion? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the oral amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The oral amendment carries. Members, any questions on the bill as amended? Again, any questions on the bill as amended? Seeing none, Senator 
Eichhorn renews his motion that Senate File 3072 be passed and passed as amended and moved to general orders. All those in favor, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. No, all those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Senator Jasinski, you're on your way. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Senator, Senator Dames, uh, I see you have your Senate file 3243 uh, up, and uh, I see you have an A1 amendment. Well, thank you, uh, members. And uh, this is Senate file 3243. There, a, there is the A1 amendment that just changes the date from uh, March 30th to, sep to exchanges it from September 30th to March 1st, and that's page three, line 17. With that, all those of, in favor of the A1 amendment, please designate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. To your bill as amended, Senator Dames. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. And the uh, bill, as amended, deals with uh, technical changes mostly, and this would be for the Department of Commerce. So I have Mr. Peter Brickwoody here. Oh, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> Didn't look over to get the right guy. Hey. <laughs> I am uh, John Kelly, for the record, uh, Director of the Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. I'm not as good looking as Peter Brickwoody, for the record. <laughs> um, please, please continue with your. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> besides all that, please continue <laughs> with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to Chair Dames uh, for carrying the bill. Um, this uh, this is the Commerce Department's uh, technical bill for this section. It makes technical changes and fixes incorrect cross references in Minnesota statutes relating to the Commerce Department. Um, it updates a uh, technical change uh, where uh, it makes uh, more inclusive of all married couples uh, to, it says, spouse rather than husband or wife. Um, it uh, also uh, updates Minnesota statutes 239.791 and 296A.01 to comply with EPA regulation regarding gasoline ethanol blends. And additionally, uh, as the chair mentioned, this updates the auto theft prevention program report to line up with when we receive the data from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension um, so that we can get the bill to the legislature in a more timely manner during the due dates we've been having to wait for BCA to send us the data before we can send out the report. And I'll stop there. With that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, well, I guess we, do we have another is there any other testifiers? I don't see anyone. So any questions from members? Seeing none, all those, uh, would you like to restate your motion, Senator Daines? Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, I move that Senate file, I restate my motion that Senate file 3243 be passed and moved to general orders as amended. With that, members, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Senate file 3243 is on its way to Senate uh, general orders. With that, Senator Dames, you have Senate file 3242, and uh, I believe you have an A1 amendment for that also, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'm mistaken. See, I am mistaken. That one has no uh, amendment. So. Senator Dames, to your bill, 3242. 
Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I would move that Senate file number 3242 be moved and passed to general orders. Senate file 3242 is another bill that's uh, part of the Department of Commerce's uh, and it's uh, dealing with modifying the registration filing for franchises. And what it does is it removes the 120 day after the fiscal year end for registration and uh, moves it to 12 months. And that way it gives new franchises an opportunity to be in business for at least 12 months before their final filing that registration. And we have uh, uh, the gentleman, John, from the uh, Department of Commerce uh, to testify on the bill. Please state your name again for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, John Kelly, uh, Director of Government Affairs at the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, thank you, Chair Dames, for carrying this department bill. Um, and members of this bill, as uh, the chairman uh, described, changes the renewal date uh, to line up rather than 120 days after the fiscal year to one year from the anniversary date of the initial registration. This will provide more time for franchisees. This is supported by uh, industry, um, and we just want to make it easier for folks to understand the timing. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Members, members have. any questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Dames renews his motion for Senate file 32. 42 to be uh, passed and rec recommended to pass and sent to general orders. With that, all those members, uh, man, all those approved, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Sure. Senator Dames, now to your Senate file 4108, and I believe that one has the A A1 amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I do have uh, the A1 amendment, and uh, that's uh, to get Senate File 4108 in the order that I would like it. So I would move the A1 amendment. With that, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. <laughs> Senator Dames to your bill as amended. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senate File 4108, uh, as amended, uh, enhances consumer protection for the annuity purchasers by incorporating the NEIC's best interest standard revisions in the Minnesota law. In 2013, the Minnesota enacted some of the strongest annuity sales protections in the country. Senate File 4108 retains, to, retains those protections, especially the provisions specifically geared to geared toward protecting seniors while increasing transparency and accountability in annuity sales. The bill is supported by the insurers, the insurance agents, the Department of Commerce, and as a result of the A1 amendment, uh, the A1 amendment is a result of some of the latest negotiations between the Department of Commerce and the industry. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Robin Rowan to discuss uh, the Senate file 4108. Mr. Rowan. Please state your name for the audio record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Robin Rowan. I'm with the Minnesota Insurance and Financial Services Council. Um, and I am pleased to um, bring you this um, super exciting annuity bill today. I want to uh, thank uh, Chair Dames for carrying the bill and the Department of Commerce for all the time they've spent negotiating this bill with us since late last fall. Um, current law requires that insurers and agents can only recommend an annuity to a consumer if that annuity is suitable based on the consumer's current financial situation. And while that, while that standard has served consumers well, the industry and the regulatory community agree that we can do better. So under the NAIC's best interest standard, insurance producers are required to act in the best interest of the consumer without placing their financial interest ahead of the consumer's interest. And there are four obligations a producer must satisfy to meet the best interest standard. Um, I'll give you the express version, but if any of you have any burning uh, questions about any of these obligations, I'm happy to answer them as well. Uh, so the first is the care obligation, which means the uh, producer must use care and skill to have a reasonable belief that the annuity uh, satisfies the consumer's financial um, needs, situation, and objectives. 
And then the bill lays out um, very explicitly the types of information that a producer needs to collect in order to meet that standard. Um, the second obligation is the disclosure ob obligation, which builds on um, current required disclosures by requiring the producer to disclose whether they are paid by commission or an asset management fee. And it also um, requires that the consumer be informed about their right to ask more questions about the producer's compensation. Uh, third is a conflict of interest obligation, which means producers must identify and avoid or reasonably manage and disclose conflicts. And it makes very clear that a material conflict must not cause the producer to put their interest above the consumer's. Um, last is the documentation obligation, which requires a producer to document the basis for um, a recommendation. The bill also builds upon the already robust insurance company supervision requirements and retains the special elevated review of sales involving seniors. And it also updates producer training requirements to reflect the new obligation. 21 states thus far have adopted the model with many more poised to act. The SEC has already implemented a best interest standard for registered variable annuities. So enacting this model will ensure that no matter what type of annuity a consumer buys and from whom, they will, see it, say, uh, ah, they will receive the same level of strong protection. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Senator Dames, I see uh, Commissioner Brickwitty is there. Does he care to testify? I suppose, uh, Mr. Chair, in order to be fair to everybody from Commerce, I should introduce him as John. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, for the record, Assistant Commissioner Peter Brickwood, I don't know how I'm going to top John's testimony from earlier on the previous <laughs> bill. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you uh, very briefly from the department. I want to thank uh, MIFC and the member companies who worked with us. Um, this is an area of law that uh, in, in uh, the negotiations in 2012, 2013 that Ms. Rowan talked about were um, really chiseled out with a lot of intention. And so I'm very happy with the bill that we have before us because I think from the de department's perspective, we're maintaining Minnesota's fairly unique floor for consumer protections, especially for seniors, while coming into alignment um, with uh, much of the rest of the country and um, making sure that we have uh, the ability to act for, uh, for businesses here in the state and to work with consumers um, to make sure that they're making informed decisions. I think, and Ms. Rowan highlighted this in her walk through the bill, I think the language on, um, on lines 4.16 and 4.17 is a really important point and a very important clarification from the NEIC model, um, simply by making that sentence earlier easier to read and not being able to place the insurance producers or the insurer's financial interest ahead of the consumer's interest is the root of the uh, bill that we have before you. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions. I would note and, and particularly thank Ms. Rowan as we worked through the nitty gritty of making sure that insurance producers who are required to take um, continuing education courses by date certain, we got those dates right, um, which took a couple of tries. The NEIC model was not drafted particularly clearly in that area. So the amendment, the A1 amendment makes those clarifications. So producers will uh, know what they have responsibilities for once this takes effect. Mr. Chairman, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Members, any questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Dames, closing comments? Uh, just that I would like to renew my motion that Senate File 4108, as amended, be recommended to pass and sent to general orders. With that motion, all those in favor of passing Senate File 4108? Uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion passes. Senate file 4108 is on its way to general orders. Well, welcome to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Finance and Policy Committee. Senator Utke, uh, Senator Utke, you have Senate File 1405, 
Senator Howe moves Senate File 1405 to be considered and moved to general orders. Senator Utke, I understand that you do have an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think it's uh, Senate File 1450, just so we don't confuse the record. It is but Senate File 1450. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, yes, uh, and thank you. And, and we've got the A2 amendment. If you could uh, move that to be before Senator us. Howe, would you move the A2 amendment? So moved. Senator Howell moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The amendment is carried. Senator Utke to Senate file to the A2 amendment. Okay, first of all, on the A2 amendment, um, what that does is, and it took out in uh, on line point or 1.9 and 1.10, we just removed health insurance um, carrier, and then going down to line 1.14, we took out that last paragraph. Uh, it was kind of um, redundant, so it uh, it made the uh, bill simpler and just more to the point of what we were actually trying to accomplish. So with that, I can jump into the bill a little bit. Um, it is a short bill, so I won't uh, use up a lot of time. Uh, got with me a, uh, someone who's going to tell us a little bit more about it. But uh, this bill makes sure that someone who is or would like to be a living do organ donor, that they're not discriminated against when purchasing life insurance, long-term care, or disability insurance. Uh, we want to make sure that coverage is not declined or limited due to a living don't a living organ or bone donor don't. Yeah, my tongue is not cooperating, but bone moral, marrow donor without additional actuarial risks. So if everything else is uh, you're, you're healthy, good, you would normally um, be able to purchase that policy at the rate that you would like as far as the, the amount of coverage, uh, that just because you're a, a living organ donor, you are not uh, looked at differently. Uh, sold a policy with lower uh, coverages than you would like, uh, et cetera. So uh, we just want to make sure that it's fair to all involved. Uh, additionally, the Minnesota Insurance and Financial Services Council supports this bill. Um, as far as I know at this point, uh, there are there is no one that opposes this. Everybody's in favor. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to uh, turn it over to Ms. Anderson for further testimony. Uh, Ms. Anderson, please state your name, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, and also Senator Aki for carrying 1450. My name is Jenny Anderson, and I'm a kidney donor, the board chair for the National Kidney Foundation, and vice president at Alliant Insurance Services, an employee benefits consulting firm. Since my kidney donation in 1999, I've spoken to countless kidney donors about the process and what impact they have with donation. Every time I speak to a potential donor, they ultimately ask what kind of adverse consequences they may face but when obtaining life, disability, or long-term care insurance. This bill will eliminate barriers from obtaining insurance for potential kidney donors and other donors and ultimately increase the number of living donors. As you heard, the Minnesota Insurance and Financial Services Council supports this legislation because being an organ donor has long no long-term impact on one's insurability. This bill also has significant positive financial impact for employers and Medicare. In 2018, one-fifth of Medicare spend was attributed to treating chronic kidney disease. A preemptive kidney transplant saves about $475,000 in medical expenses. By reducing barriers that donors face, we can then increase the number of living donors and redu reduce healthcare spend for private employers and Medicare. I'd like to ask for your support in Senate File 1450, and thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, members, uh, any questions or comments for Senator Utke? Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Senator Utke, thank you for carrying this bill. I think it is thank very you. important and a very good thing. Um, I did just want to check that with this amendment, particularly removing in health insurance out of the language, um, is that still a uh, supported by everybody that we talked about it being supported by, and this isn't a problem in terms of discrimination? Senator Rutke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Correct. It's it's supported by all, um, but that did not affect anything here. It actually 
it did what we were trying, wanting to do. So we're good. Okay. Senator Ken, follow up. Thank you. Members, other questions? Seeing none, Senator Howe renews his motion that Senate File 1450, as amended, be recommended to pass and referred to general orders. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion carries. Senate File 1450 has passed as amended and referred to general orders. Thank you, Senator Rutke. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Next, we have Senator Johnson. Good afternoon, Senator Johnson, and welcome to the Commerce and Consumer Protection and Finance Policy Committee. Uh, you have Senate File 3049. Senator Eichhorn, would you move Senate File 3049? Senator Johnson, or Senator Eichhorn, moves Senate File 3049 be recommended to pass and referred to general orders. Senator Johnson, to your bill, Senate File 3049. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for having us here today. And I will start off with saying I don't remember ever being in front of the Commerce Committee before. This may be a first time. I don't know if it's like the Finance Committee where I have to bring donuts or something. But well, Usually I, we would have you go through initiation, but apparently we must have missed that. So you're good. <laughs> After good six go. years, I think I've, I've grandfathered in then. I don't do the initiation. But thank you for taking time to do this. Uh, appreciate it. So Senate File 3049 addresses a gap in Minnesota's treatment of collateral securing a federally chartered home loan bank, an FHLB, when lending to a Minnesota-based insurance company. This consensus litigation has been negotiated with the Minnesota Department of Commerce. That's still true, right, Peter? Correct. Yep, we're good. And is not opposed to this bill in any form. We're not aware of any objections to the bill, including the insurance industry. Mr. Chair, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my testifier to go through and explain a little bit about today's bill. Mr. Coyle, please state your name, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thanks, Senator Johnson, for bringing the bill forward today, and thank the committee for hearing it. Uh, in the interest of time, we do have another testifier who's testifying via Zoom, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as uh, Senator Johnson noted, the bill does not have opposition in committee today, to our knowledge. So with that, I'd ask Mr. Aaron Lee if he could speak on behalf of the bill uh, to, to uh, limit the testimony. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lee, uh, if you are joining us uh, by Zoom. Yes. Good afternoon. If Mr. you would Chair go ahead and members and of the committee. yourself and state who you represent, we would appreciate it. Proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Aaron Lee, and I serve as general counsel of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Des Moines. The Federal Home Loan Bank of Des Moines is one of 11 federal home loan banks whose primary business is to extend low-cost credit to its membership of more than 6,000 banks, credit unions, and insurance companies across the country. The loans that we extend to our members are fully secured by collateral pledged to the Federal Home Loan Bank and are used by members to help manage their liquidity needs. Under current state law, if a Minnesota insurance company that was also a Federal Home Loan Bank member were to have financial difficulty and enter into a receivership with the Depart Department of Commerce, the receiver could seek a stay on any collateral pledged by that insurance company to support Federal Home Loan Bank borrowings. This, this bill would harmonize Minnesota, Minnesota state insurance law with federal bank insolvency laws by limiting the extent to which a receiver could exert control over that collateral that's pledged to a federal home loan bank. Uh, unfortunately, without this legislation, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Des Moines is required to impose, impose more onerous collateral requirements on its insurance companies located in, in states like Minnesota that do not have this legislation. So the legislation would bring certainty regarding uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank's obligations under the law in the event of an insolvency and would, would allow the Federal Home Loan Bank to lend to Minnesota insurance company members on more favorable terms. 
Um, so th that is a summary of, of the bill, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Mr. Lee. And if you could uh, stay with us in case there are some questions, we would appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Coyle, any further comments on your part? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the committee's time. We appreciate it. Members, any questions for Senator Johnson on Senate File 3049? Members, any questions? Senator Johnson, any final comments? I'd just like to thank the members and yourself for hearing the bill today. Appreciate this uh, very niche but uh, useful bill uh, to move Minnesota Commerce forward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Acorn renews his motion at Senate File 3049 be recommended to pass and sent to general orders. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion carries. Senate File 3949 is uh, off I to the general it. orders. Members, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know you're a very efficient adjourner, so I wanted to jump in very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, just, I know we've passed all these really good bills to the, mm -hmm. it sounds like to the floor, and I was just curious if you could uh, enlighten us about your thoughts about how this is going to go. Is there going to be an omnibus bill of any kind? What your, what your general plans are for the committee moving forward? No intentions to have an omnibus bill. We're passing all these bills out individually, and we will... Uh, have a meeting this coming Wednesday that will be announced. I think that's already been posted. And uh, that will be for this coming Wednesday. Then we'll see the following Monday if we need a meeting. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Seeing none, that concludes the business of the day, and we are adjourned.